The Dean's Cup is Duke's premier oral advocacy competition. The Moot Court Board hosts the Dean's Cup annually for second and third year students. This year's tournament saw 31 talented students compete in the initial fall bracket before being narrowed to the 16 semifinalists you see on the back of your program. We are proud of all of our competitors and our semifinalists. We are especially proud of the four final competitors arguing today. For the petitioners, 2L Farabera and 3L Luke Morgan. For the respondents, 3L Hugh Hamilton and 2L Jack Smith. We would also like to thank the following individuals for their incredible contributions to the 2019 Dean's Cup. Dean Abrams, Professor Anderseer, Professor Beal, Professor Metzloff, Sarah Emily and Corinne Cruz from the Clerkship Office, Laura Grisham and Elizabeth Green from the Events Office, Taylor Clark, Pam Wyatt from Student Affairs, Brian Seiko and Zach Ezor, and of course all of our faculty who judged both the oral arguments and the written briefs. Our biggest thank you goes to the judges who you can read about in your programs. Those are Judge Restrepo from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, Judge Ho from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and Judge Moritz from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. This is a case about a fatal cross-border shooting by a U.S. Border Patrol agent, Petitioner Swartz. Standing on U.S. soil, Agent Swartz fired across the border at an unarmed 16-year-old Mexican citizen, allegedly without justification, killing him on a public street. On behalf of his estate, the teenager's mother, Respondent Rodriguez, sued Agent Swartz personally for damages, contending that Agent Swartz violated her son's purported Fourth Amendment right to be free from excessive force in unreasonable seizure. At the Rule 12b6 stage, a divided Ninth Circuit panel ruled in her favor, holding one, that a Bivens action for damages may lie under these circumstances, two, that the decedent was protected by the Fourth Amendment, even though he was a non-resident alien seized abroad, and three, the Agent Swartz is not otherwise protected by qualified immunity. Agent Swartz is challenging those rulings by the Ninth Circuit. Finally, we ask that while the arguments are ongoing, please silence your phones, remain in your seats, and refrain from talking. Thank you. Please be seated. Welcome, everyone. We will now hear the arguments in the case of Rodriguez versus Swartz. We'll hear from the petitioner first. And I understand you'd like some rebuttal, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Three minutes, please. Three minutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Farah Vera, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Luke Morgan, represent the petitioner, Agent Lonnie Schwartz. I will address Bivens, and Mr. Morgan will address the extraterritoriality of the Fourth Amendment and qualified immunity. In Ziegler v. Abbasi, this court called implied causes of action ancient, disfavored, and a judicial practice that this court has refused to engage in for over 30 years. But in this case, the Ninth Circuit extended an implied cause of action anyway. In doing so, the Ninth Circuit committed an error, and we're asking this court to reverse that error. Then why did you concede that Bivens is available in the district court? Uh, well, in the district court level, we were, we were trying to specifically focus on the qualified immunity issue. Um, however, we weren't conceding you it. You could walk, walk and chew gum at the same time. Why did you, <laughs> you did not challenge, I'm wondering if it's even preserved, this, this Bivens argument that you're making that you seem to think is so obvious. You're right, Your Honor. That was definitely a mistake on our part on the district court level. However, we do contend that the Bivens analysis still must go forward because as this court explained in Abbasi, Bivens is always an antecedent matter. That is why in Hernandez, even though that wasn't the specific cause of action that was alleged in the uh, circuit court level, on the Fifth Circuit Court, it was still preserved for the Supreme Court level to send it back down. So do you think this Bivens claim is analogous enough to the original Bivens claim, or do we have to break new ground? 
Now, as the respondents concede, this is a new context for Bivens, and I, I believe that is entirely accurate. It's a new context for Bivens because it doesn't resemble the They're fact— They're both Fourth Amendment cases, right? That's true, Your Honor, but uh, it, the same is true for Abbasi. Abbasi was also a Fourth Amendment case, but in that case, the court still held that that was a new context and found that a there class was— Class action involving post-9-11 activities, very different than this case. That's true, Your Honor, but there have also been cases, for example, in which the Supreme Court found uh, in Carlson v. Green that there was an Eighth Amendment violation, a Bivens claim for an Eighth Amendment violation, and then a subsequent case where this court found that there wasn't a subsequent Bivens extension for also an Eighth Amendment violation. And as this court explained in Abbasi, even a modest extension is still an extension. Okay, but in, in what world do we think Congress was perfectly fine with the shooting of an innocent, unarmed boy? In no world, Your Honor. And in fact, that's so why it's Congress not really that much of a stretch then here. It's a stretch because we're extending monetary damages to this claim. What's been authorized by Congress is criminal liability for these sorts of uh, this sort of conduct. And in fact, that's already occurred. Agent why isn't civil liability lesser included? I'd rather pay money than be put in prison. That's true, Your Honor. But as this court explained in Abbasi, civil liability tends to be more of a problem from a separation of powers perspective because it requires an assessment from Congress about the operations system-wide. So that's an interesting theoretical question, but CBP policy also prohibits this, so there's no separation of powers problem. It's true, Your Honor. CBP policy prohibits this and then describes as the procedure that is supposed to result from it a DOJ investigation and then criminal prosecution. At no point does the CBP authorize civil liability, nor does Congress authorize civil liability for this sort of suit. And as this court explained in Abbasi, monetary damages tend to pose a bigger problem uh, or to tend to pose a big problem for individuals because they often make individuals second guess their choices. And that's a bigger problem from criminal liability because under criminal liability, the government assesses the claims before deciding to bring a prosecution. That's not true of civil liability where anyone can bring any claim regardless of the merits of the case itself. That would subject individuals to what this court in verdugo Urquidez feared most, which was case by case adjudications of the government. And that poses a... Well, don't we do that in a lot of different contexts, case-by-case -case adjudications of the government? That's true, Your Honor. But the court in verdugo Urquidez worried about that concern specifically from extraterritorial plaintiffs because it alleged that the big fear was individuals with no connection to the United States bringing these Fourth Amendment claims would subject the United States to a multiplicity of suits, especially because the well, United States... Suppose we write narrowly and confine a judgment to the shooting in the back of a juvenile that pose no threat to national security or anybody else within 30 feet of the border. Suppose we make it real narrow. Would that alleviate your concerns? It would not, Your Honor, because as this court explained in verdugo Urquidez, that narrowness can't solve the problem. In verdugo Urquidez, this court was confronted with a singular case. A single Mac Mexican national faced a seizure in his home in Mexico by the DEA. But the court... Everything took place in Mexico. At Here, the shooter was clearly on U.S. soil. That is true, Your Honor. That, that is a distinction between verdugo Urquidez in this case. Uh, however, in verdugo Urquidez, the court still analogized to any U.S. official that exhibited extraterritorial conduct because in that case it held that by allowing for a Fourth Amendment right to proceed, any U.S. official, including the military, could be subjected to a Fourth Amendment suit. Even though this case is a little different because you have conduct occurring from the U.S. side of the border, that's not significant because the United States frequently engages in conduct from within the United States that could result in a Fourth Amendment violation abroad. What if J.A. was a national, U.S. national? If J.A. was a U.S. national, then he would be able to have, uh, there would still be a, a Bivens separation of powers and uh, special factors that counsel hesitation analysis that would have to proceed, which may prevent a Bivens action from proceeding, but he would certainly have a Fourth Amendment right, which my colleague Mr. Morgan will talk about in a little bit. So if he was a national, there would be no Bivens action in your world? Well, Your Honor, even yes in every... No. no, there would not be a Bivens action, and that's because in every case that this court has addressed since 1980 for the last 39 years, all of the individuals were U.S. nationals. All of them claimed constitutional violations, and yet none of them got Bivens actions, even though some of the claims that they were contending... None of them were murdered. That's true, Your Honor. None of it them seems, were murdered. It seems to be a pretty heroic assumption that Congress would not want to cure and provide an action for, frankly, the most grotesque violation of a right one can imagine, which is murder. Your Honor, they have provided an action. The action is criminal liability, and this is a crime. It is murder. It is not a tort. You, you think Congress, if the question were actually presented to Congress, 
We know they're busy, so they don't answer everything. That's why we have Bivens, right, to, to, to infer actions when it's appropriate. You think Congress, if actually presented with this question, would say, you know what, murder's fine, no, no civil damages. We'll put them in prison, but you get nothing. Right. Uh, well, I'm not sure what Congress would say on this specific issue, but regardless— well, why isn't it obvious that they would say, well, of course, damages— Congress is absolutely allowed to do that, Your Honor, but the proper medium, as this court explained in Bush v. Lucas, the, the inquiry in special factors analysis that counsel hesitation is specifically who should decide the case, Congress or the courts. And Congress should decide this case. Congress may very well say there should be a, a civil action in these cases. And if Congress decides that, that is perfectly fair and reasonable for Congress to do. But isn't one of the questions just whether there is a remedy available? And is there a remedy well, Your Honor, for this plaintiff, what is the remedy, if not this? Well, Your Honor, under the criminal liability that Agent Schwartz faced, had he been convicted and found guilty— You're going to talk about restitution? But that's, Precisely, not, Your that's, Honor. A, that's entirely up to the government's discretion, first of all, whether they charge. Secondly, whether they can get a conviction, as can be seen as what happened in this case. I mean, I think they're retrying this individual, Mr. Schwartz. Yeah, it's probably judgment. But, I mean, it's—and it may be judgment-proof. That's not a remedy for this— Victim. Well, Your Honor, as this court explained in Schweiker v. Chilogy, the absence of the remedy does not imply the existence of a Bivens action. Moreover, as this court explained in multiple suits, including Abbasi and including, uh, including Malesko and Wilkie v. Robbins, the existence of administrative procedures, such as, as in this case, the DOJ investigation and uh, the criminal conviction afterward, even if it is up to the government's discretion and not as complete of a remedy as this court could afford, still shows us, it gives us a hint that this is within Congress's domain. And so long as we know that this is within Congress's domain, Abbasi instructs that if Congress might doubt the necessity or efficacy of this action, the courts must refrain. So basically what you're saying is we're never going to do new actions ever again. Well, this Sounds like a categorical rule. Well, Your Honor, Abbasi did recognize the continued force of uh, Bivens' actions in the context in which they arose. So in the context of... Right, but you're, what you're essentially saying is we're never going to extend beyond what the presidents require. Would you, would you at least acknowledge that that's essentially the, what you're proposing, a categorical rule and nothing new ever, ever again? I, I would not say that. I think there, there well, could then be what, something... What would you do yet not cover murder? That, that's what I'm having trouble with. Well, Your, Your Honor, there can be new causes of action. There can be situations in a, in a new context if the special factors don't indicate that Congress should be deciding the issue, but the case is still pretty similar to Bivens. For example, if we had a situation that was similar facts to Bivens, but we had a different agency, perhaps not the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, now the DEA, um, but an entirely separate agency engaging in that search and seizure, but still domestically, then we could argue that it is a new context because even a modest extension is an extension, but the special factors that counsel hesitation aren't that strong. This was Bivens. I mean, this was a Bivens case. It was a seizure. You agree it's a seizure, right? The kid's dead. This is a seizure. It is certainly a seizure. And it was a Fourth Amendment seizure. It was, a, it was certainly an unreasonable seizure. Uh, we do not contend that, the, that JA had a Fourth Amendment right. Um, and Mr. Morgan will address that in a little bit due to the sufficient connections test. Under Excellent. We'll look forward to his. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but in this case, we also have a case, since we're looking primarily at whether or not something is within Congress's domain, we're looking inherently to figure out whether or not Congress should be deciding the issue or not. And here, because we have a situation where there is a national security concern inherent in Customs and Border Protection, and that is typically within the domain of Congress, that that issue should be left to Congress. So, and, and, you know, you're suggesting there's a national security concern when the Border Patrol agent kills an unarmed child. That's a national security concern? Your Honor, I see that my time has expired. May I answer briefly yeah, yeah. conclude? No, that is not a national security concern. What we contend is that Congress has a rational basis for being able to find that extending a Bivens action, extending monetary damages against CBP agents could pose a national security concern. Thank you. We'll hear <laughs> Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Luke Morgan for the petitioner on the Fourth Amendment and qualified immunity issues. The Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches. Let me start with the qualified immunity. All right, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about qualified immunity. Why are you even arguing this? Are you, are you suggesting that, that uh, the constitutional right not to be shot in the back didn't exist? 
There's no doubt that uh, the Fourth Amendment protects a right not to be shot in the back. But the question is whether an individual possesses a Fourth Amendment right. And we contend that J.A. did not possess a Fourth Amendment right yes. because he was a non-citizen with no sufficient voluntary connections to the United States to render him essentially part of the national community. So that would, in essence, immunize Border Patrol from shooting people across the border. If they're standing on the other side of the border, in your worldview, they can shoot them with impunity. Kill them. That's not necessarily the case, Your Honor. Well, that's uh, what happened in this case. Well, in this case, Agent Schwartz was prosecuted, and a jury of his peers acquitted under him. The, right. un, un, under the civil context we're talking about. So there's a, you're, you're immune from any civil liability. Well, for instance, if J.A. was an American citizen, there would be no doubt that he had a Fourth Amendment right. Okay. But J.A., as, as a non-citizen with no sufficient connections to the United States, did not possess a Fourth Amendment so, But is that the test? That's the test that this court enunciated in Verdugo or key does, which is the controlling Fourth Amendment Amendment. Yeah, but precedent. it seems to me that Justice Kennedy's view has prevailed. Well, Justice, he didn't go along with that test. That's true, Your Honor. Uh, although I would note that Justice Kennedy did join the majority opinion. Uh, Justice Stevens, for instance. It is curious what he did. I agree. <laughs> but but at, the end of the, at, the, at the end of the day, we have the Boumediene Boum 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 uh, opinion. That's it true. seems to have overtaken Verdugo. I don't think that's the case, Your Honor. And the, the respondent argues in her brief, for instance, that uh, Boumediene clarified the Verdugo or Kidas test. Uh, but Boum Justice Kennedy's opinion in Boumediene only makes one reference to Verdugo or Kidas, and it's a seasight to his own concurrence. Um, that's, that's a concession by Justice Kennedy uh, that the Verdugo or Kidas majority did not, as the respondent alleges, essentially adopt his impracticable and anomalous test. The fact that the Boumediene majority relies on the Verdugo concurrence cuts in your favor or against you? No, Your Honor. Uh, the respondent alleges in her brief, for instance, that the majority by in, in Verdugo or Kidas, by talking about the significant and deleterious consequences of extending the right, thereby adopts a functional test. Uh, and therefore, Justice Kennedy's concurrence is essentially the controlling opinion from Verdugo or Kidas. Uh, but if you look at what Boumediene actually said, Boumediene makes no attempt to clarify Verdugo or Kidas, and the court explicitly limits its holding to the suspension clause, which is why virtually every lower court since Boumediene has used the Verdugo or Kidas test rather than Boumediene for adjudicating Bill of Rights uh, uh, questions as opposed to suspension clause questions. And, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, the suspension clause is a structural limit on government power. By its very text, it's distinct from the Fourth Amendment, which purports to be a right held by individual classes of persons. Uh, so it, it's the textual basis that Justice Kennedy objects to, uh, drawing that from a strict textualist method. That's his objection in Verdugo or Kidas. Didn't, ben, didn't Justice Kennedy and Boumediene, if I'm thinking correctly, didn't he review about 20 years of case law uh, extraterritorial cases and, and not restricted to any particular any particular set of facts or issue and doesn't that suggest that his whole the holding was much broader than what you'd like to tell us today it, it's no doubt that Justice Kennedy and Boumediene alleged essentially a, a century long in fact pattern mm -hmm. of a functional approach to extraterritorial right. constitutional adjudication and to that point for instance he marshaled the insular cases uh, but we believe that the insular cases actually have a different lesson. For example, if you look at the case of Balzac, which comes down in 1922, it's the last of the insular cases, uh, and it's uh, Chief Justice Taft's opinion. He says that the Constitution applies wherever and whenever the United States exerts its sovereign power. And as the Verdugo or Quidas court notes, uh, when the United States exerts its sovereign power is when Congress is the ultimate governing authority for an arena. Uh, now, Justice Taft notes that uh, the, the functional approach taken in the insular cases is a result of the fact that different constitutional guarantees, by their very nature, have different applicability to different territories, mm -hmm. even territories uh, that the United States controls. But Justice Taft says in Balzac that uh, the fundamental rights uh, from the beginning were incorporated within the United States' as territories. Uh, so in fact, the insular cases, far from endorsing a functional approach, endorse a bright line approach where, where Congress is the governing authority, the ultimate governing authority over a territory, the Constitution applies.
Uh, when that's not the case, even under the Boumediene test, and, and we can talk about the Boumediene Let's test. Let's do talk about Boumediene Wait, didn't, didn't all the conduct <laughs> issue take place within the territory? The, the firing of the weapon took place within the territory of the United States, right? That's true, Your Honor. And, and there's no doubt, for instance, that the Constitution and the laws of the United States governed Agent Swartz's behavior when he fired his gun. Uh, but the question in this case is, does the Fourth Amendment right uh, do, does J.A. have a Fourth Amendment right that he can press against Agent Schwartz? So that's why there's a distinction, for instance, between a United States citizen who's injured in this scenario and, and J.A. who's injured in this scenario. What if he'd been a, a permanent resident alien? In that case, Your Honor, I, I think that J.A. would have a Fourth Amendment right uh, because citizenship is not required. Uh, it's the question from Verdugo or Quidez is whether you have sufficiently established yourself as part of the national community. What if he's a DACA? Well, Your Honor, there have been cases, for instance, the Seventh Circuit in the United States versus Mesa Rodriguez, quoting the Verdugo or Quidez test, said that uh, uh, undocumented immigrants have a Second Amendment right. Uh, an undocumented, undocumented immigrant, specifically, who had been in the country for 20 years, had established himself as part of the national community. So the language that has emerged from cases on this question is whether they have taken on, essentially, the rights and, rights and responsibilities, duties and obligations of existing within our national community. Uh, there's no serious argument that J.A. had connections to the United States that rise to that level. Were US citizens, right? His grandparents were, at the time, lawful residents. Um, they've since become U.S. citizens. But, Your Honor, the Constitution is not contagious. Uh, you don't catch constitutional rights by interacting with people who have those constitutional rights. Now, if J.A., for instance, if his parents uh, were U.S. citizens and he was full-time taken care of by his parents, then that's a different scenario. But all we have here is that his grandparents were citizens and he was relatively near the border. He lived in a border town. Uh, and it can't be the case that ge mere geographic proximity is, alone is enough. Uh, turning, uh, as Chief Justice Moritz requested, to the Boumediene test briefly. Uh, Boumediene enunciates three factors. Uh, the first is citizenship and status. Uh, both count against J.A. here. He's a non-citizen, and unlike the petitioners in Boumediene, he's not a detainee within the exclusive control of the United States, which the Seventh Circuit has pointed out, uh, points towards someone having some constitutional protection, because if they don't have constitutional protection, you know, what do they have? Uh, second of all, we look at the control of the territory. And I've already discussed this briefly. The question is whether Congress has control of the territory. And there's no doubt that Congress does not exercise de jure sovereignty over the Mexican side of the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, but there is some, at least by the record in this case, it looks like there is some aspects of control over that, just the border itself, that street where this young man was walking. It, it's undoubtedly true that the United States exercises some authority over that over that space. Over it does so with the consent of the Mexican government. Uh, that's not necessarily the It's kind of like the lease in Boumediene. It, with Guantanamo Bay, Your Honor, yes. It, it, in that sense, Cuba consented to it, but uh, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that Mexican law applies on the U.S.-Mexico side of the border. Uh, Cuban law has no force on the Guantanamo Bay naval base. And I think the difference is best illustrated by imagining the reaction of the United States if uh, Cuba drove a military caravan into the Guantanamo Bay naval base or if Mexico drove a military caravan along its side of the Mexican border. Uh, in the latter circumstance, we might wonder you know, what was going on, uh, but it wouldn't be an act of war. Um, and I think that you can distinguish them that way. Uh, further, I would argue that the, United, the control the United States exerts over the Mexican side of the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, relying too much on that factor points to the problem with the test in general. Uh, which is that uh, the United States exercises enough control over email servers in Germany to search those servers. Uh, that control test essentially authorizes a worldwide class of plaintiffs, and that's the problem here. The final Boumediene factor is the practical obstacles. Those practical obstacles mirror the practical obstacles we talk about in the Bivens context, and it's primarily this global class of plaintiffs uh, that is waiting for a Fourth Amendment right to be recognized. Now, suppose you limit this global class of plaintiffs to unarmed children mm -hmm. shot in the back. Well, Your Honor, I, I don't think that the court can, can slice well, we can, the... We can do whatever we want. 
Why can't we? That's, that's very fair, Your Honor. This court has never before uh, sliced uh, the Fourth Amendment right, for example, between a, a search and a seizure, saying that one person has a right not to be seized, but not a right not to be searched. Um, within the functional test, we would still have a problem of looking at the control and looking at the, the citizenship status. And with respect to those two factors, a, a person whose email is searched in Germany is no different than JA. Um, they, have, they have had a- they're, they're alive. They're alive, that's true, Your Honor. Um, but <laughs> Uh, in terms of having their Fourth Amendment right violated, it's been it, it's been violated in both cases if that right exists. Um, and this this quandary about the Fourth Amendment is precisely why the court can and should end its analysis here, uh, because as it noted in Pearson versus Callahan, uh, it's it's frequently the better decision to decide on the existence of the right rather than the clearly established prong, because the facts are often going to be clearer on the existence of the right than they are on the clearly established prong. But turning to that prong briefly, yeah. uh, this court has said in Pauli, uh, this court has said in Al Kid that a right must be settled beyond all debate before it's clearly established. And in Pauli versus White, it clarified that the plaintiff and the lower court must identify a case, uh, identify a case that would give a reasonable officer notice that he was violating the Fourth Amendment. Well, we said the exact opposite in Hope and last term in the South. Well, in Hope v. Pelzer, for example, Your Honor, uh, this court used the obvious case language, mm -hmm. and the respondent relies on that language. Why isn't this the obvious case? It's so, so blatant and so obvious that uh, any reasonable officer would know that this was not knowing what the status of the individual he was shooting at was, because that's what we have to assume here. It would know that it was, it was unconstitutional to right to do so. Your Honor, Why isn't this a hope case? It, it's not a hope case for two reasons. First of all, hope is an Eighth Amendment violation, and this court has traditionally uh, kept officers on a tighter leash with respect to the Eighth Amendment than it has with the Fourth Amendment. That's why, for example, the Fourth Amendment has a good faith exception. Uh, they, there's no good faith exception for cruel and unusual punishment. But second of all, this isn't an obvious case because the, ex may I briefly conclude? Please, yeah. Because the existence of the border in between uh, the officer and the victim, the fact that it's a cross-border shooting calls into doubt the very existence of the constitutional right. The question is not whether the officer could have known that he was doing something wrong or even committing a murder. The question is whether the officer could have known that he was violating the Fourth Amendment. And that's not the case here. So under your analysis, if J.A. had been a permanent resident alien or DACA, Fourth Amendment protection would have attached, right? That's true, Your Honor, although the Bivens. Right, I get that. But because he was a Mexican national, he doesn't have that Fourth Amendment right. That, that's what you're telling us. That's correct, Your Honor. Now, the citizenship doesn't matter for the purpose of the clearly established wrong because the officer didn't know a JA's citizenship status. And that's why, under Pearson versus Callahan, uh, this court should decide this on the existence of the Fourth Amendment right, uh, because otherwise the court would be in the position of saying that a right was clearly established mm -hmm. and that it did not exist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from the petitioner, or I'm, the respondent, I'm sorry. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Hugh Hamilton, and I, along with my co-counsel, Jack Smith, represent the respondent, Araceli Rodriguez. I'll discuss why a Bivens action is appropriate and necessary to remedy Rodriguez's loss of her son. And Mr. Smith will discuss why the Fourth Amendment prohibited Agent Swartz from shooting without justification a child, and why Agent Swartz is not entitled to qualified immunity. Decided by this court nearly 50 years ago, Bivens recognizes the right of one harmed by an unlawful search and seizure of federal law enforcement to seek a damages remedy. In that case, That's exactly your problem, right? I mean, 50 years ago, we did implied rights of action very differently than what we do today ever since Sandoval. That's true, Your Honor. The general approach to implied causes of action has changed, but as recently as Ziegler v. Abbasi, this court reaffirmed the continued force and necessity of Bivens in the search and seizure context in which it arose. We said it's disfavored. Mm -hmm. The Bivens remedy is not disfavored. Expanding Bivens to context for which it is ill-suited is disfavored. You acknowledge that this is an exception. This is a new context as a factual matter, Your Honor. Um, certainly a cross-border shooting is factually distinct from the search and seizure in a home, mm -hmm. but it does not diverge as a structural matter, and that is what this court's Bivens jurisprudence is trying to suss out, whether the differences between a claim and Bivens in the first instance uh, 
create separation of powers concerns. Well, Bivens doesn't involve any inter international diplomacy concerns. This one has those concerns in spades. Your Honor, this does not actually implicate diplomatic discussions. Uh, certainly the United States... The assassination of a foreign national doesn't implicate international concerns? It certainly I implicates international concerns, but it does not impinge on the diplomatic prerogatives of either of the political branches. Weren't there That's ongoing negotiations here between our two governments because of this, this occurrence? Your Honor... In this very case, we had those concerns. Your Honor, there are ongoing discussions between the United States and Mexico on a whole host of issues related to the But this was now. significant. And this was significant. Certainly this featured in the discussions, but the discussions were not for the purpose of resolving this claim. Certainly that would be a stronger uh, instance of diplomatic prerogatives. But here this is the single claim of an aggrieved mother, and the civil adjudication of that does not withdraw any option or prerogative from the political branch. Certainly Mexico has expressly consented to a remedy here by virtue of their letter. Uh, and so it's hard to imagine how this actually impacts any option that the executive may have had in these negotiations. Um, and the petitioner's um, recitation of certain cases in which this court has declined to extend Bivens beyond the search and seizure context, um, it's easy to overlook the fact that those cases were themselves outliers. In several of those cases, plaintiffs sought to sue an entity defendant which is plainly at odds with the purpose of Bivens, which is the deterrence of individual law enforcement officers from violating the Constitution. Uh, and in other cases, there was a comprehensive remedial scheme that evinced Congress was not, did not view a uh, damages remedy as necessary in those circumstances. What's your response to counsel's argument that this would open, in essence, the floodlights of litigation? Servers in Germany, all sorts of incidents on the border, everybody would all of a sudden be a plaintiff in the U.S. District Court. Uh, Your Honor, that argument is to some extent always available whenever we're dealing with a, an extension of Bivens as to a foreign national, but what's essential here is that the conduct occurred in the United States. Everything that Agent Swartz did when he pulled the trigger was from his duty station in Arizona. And that's a critical distinction for two reasons. First, the counsel's going to say all the searches of the computers in Germany were done in the United States. Um, well, Your Honor, the... Uh, the touchstone of whether a claim is domestic or extraterritorial is what is the sort of conduct that Congress sought to regulate. Uh, that is, comes from this court's jurisprudence on the presumption against extraterritoriality. And although that is an admittedly awkward fit uh, in Bivens, which mm -hmm. is a judicially implied cause of action, mm -hmm. uh, there are reasons to consider presumption against extraterritoriality in Bivens extensions. Uh, this was the argument made by then Judge Kavanaugh and his concurrence in May Shall Be Higginbotham in the D.C. Circuit. Um, in that case, uh, foreign nationals were detained and interrogated in the Horn of Africa, and that was a presumption against extraterritoriality concern because the conduct of those officers was outside of the United States. And I would argue that similarly, the search of a foreign computer would implicate those same uh, presumption against extraterritoriality concerns. Um, and so were a court faced with an extension of Bivens to a truly extraterritorial claim involving something far removed from the United States' interests, that would be a special factor counseling hesitation. But the other special factors that the petitioner has invoked here really don't carry water. Um, the petitioner discussed an abstract national security impact. Uh, but we know two things from this court's decision in Ziegler v. Abbasi. First, that search and seizure claims are the best sort of Bivens claims. And second, that national security is not a talisman used to ward off inconvenient claims. Those propositions taken together means that we have to define an impact on national security with a greater degree of precision than the petitioner has done here. Uh, What's more relevant to national security than border security? Certainly, Your Honor, border security is important to national security, but it's not enough to invoke the fact that the defendant's employer, uh, Border Patrol, plays a national security role. If that was the case, we wouldn't have Bivens because the defendants there were what is now the DEA. Uh, and certainly the DEA plays a very similar national security role as does Border Patrol. They are certainly involved to a similar extent on the border with drug interdiction activities. And when you consider the universe of federal law enforcement officers that have the authority to use force on behalf of the United States, it's hard to imagine an officer that doesn't play some sort of national security role. Whether it's an FBI agent, CIA, DEA, or Border Patrol, everyone that's entrusted to use force on, the, on behalf of the United States I think it's a stretch to say that every domestic crime triggers national security concerns. This is an actual border issue uh, involving the death of a foreign national. Certainly, Your Honor, but it has none of the hallmarks of national security concerns that this court invoked in Ziegler v. Abbasi and lower courts have invoked. 
For example, the problem in Ziegler v. Abbasi was not the fact that the defendants were national security personnel. It was the fact that they were the attorney general and the FBI director. And in suing figures that senior, what the plaintiff there was doing was effecting a backdoor attack on the United States policy response to 9-11. So if you were read in this opinion, how would you define the extension of Bivens to satisfy us that it's not going to open this Pandora's box of horribles? Your Honor, it would be cross-border uses of excessive force by law enforcement agents acting in the United States. And it's not even the case that this court has to arbitrarily confine its holding. The existing doctrine of Bivens does that for you. Because whenever there is any meaningful factual distinction, the court has to perform special factors analysis anew. And that inquiry will catch anything that causes structural or separation of powers concerns. I'm sorry. I would say I have some discomfort in, in extending a judicial remedy when Congress itself, in creating private remedies under the FTCA or Section 1983, has not, would not have extended it to this extraterritorial circumstance here. What does that tell us about what Congress might do or intend here? Well, Your Honor, the existence... I understand it's a kind of a strange thing to compare at this point, but... It is. But the existence of an alternative remedial scheme is significant only insofar as it evinces congressional skepticism of the need for a damages remedy. And none of the remedial schemes that Petitioner has invoked does that. The FTCA does not do that. The availability of criminal restitution does not do that. And Section 1983 does not do that. 1983 specifically limits relief to people within the jurisdiction of the United States. Yes, Your Honor. And there are two reasons why that's not relevant here. First, 1983 and Bivens have never been symmetrical. 1983 actually permits claims for violations of certain statutory duties as well as constitutional rights. And second, there is something inherently federal about borders themselves. Congress would have had no reason to think that state or local officials would be regularly engaging in border patrol or cross-border activities. So there's nothing conceptually odd about the fact that... State officials that are on the border, perhaps? I mean, are in areas near the border? State officials might not have... I understand they're not border patrol, but... Well, Your Honor, in light... States that are on the border, perhaps, they might have anticipated? Well, Your Honor, it's certainly difficult to impute congressional intent one way or another with respect to the border in light of 1983's legislative history, which was, of course, a reaction to the Reconstruction. But there is nothing conceptually awkward about the fact that a federal agent's liability for cross-border misconduct might be different than a state or local officer simply by virtue of their propensity to engage in that conduct in the first instance. And the FTCA is similarly irrelevant here. The fact that Rodriguez could not bring an FTCA claim for this conduct by virtue of the foreign country exception says nothing about Congress's general predisposition towards extraterritorial claims. And that is because the foreign country exception was motivated by choice of law concerns. Congress did not want its agents subjected to the laws of a foreign sovereign. And that concern completely washes away in Bivens because the law is invariably the Constitution of the United States. And finally, the petitioner's reliance on the availability of criminal restitution completely elides the focus on congressional intent because criminal prosecution is always available whenever there's a crime. But it's not the victim's remedy. It's the people's remedy. And the availability of restitution is certainly speculative. It depends on meeting a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. And it's not going to be coextensive with the remedies that would be available in a tort suit. So that would result in the perverse situation in which the more serious the intrusion rising to the level of an independent crime, the less relief that would be available. Finally, this is not an attack on policy. This does not impede any national security investigation. And this is not in any way impinging on the prerogatives of the political branches, which is the touchstone of the Bivens inquiry. The United States has an incontrovertible interest in regulating the conduct of its own officers acting on its own soil and using force in the name of the United States. For that reason, this Bivens claim should proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, Jack Smith from Ms. Rodriguez. I will be discussing why, Fourth Amendment, why the Fourth Amendment prohibited this unlawful shooting and why qualified immunity is unavailable to insulate this conduct. Your Honors, this case asks whether a U.S. law enforcement agent standing on U.S. soil must answer to our Constitution when he fires his weapon across the border and shoots an unarmed boy in the back ten times. He must answer for this conduct for two main reasons, Your Honors. First, this court has rejected the kind of formalistic extraterritoriality inquiry on which petitioner relies to exclude J.A. from the Constitution's protection. And second, the facts known to Agent Swartz at the time he decided to pull the trigger present the most obvious case of an unreasonable use of force than one can imagine. Now, Your Honors. When it comes to the question of whether our law applies or not, why wouldn't that be the very situation where we would want to be formalistic? Wouldn't we want an on-off switch rather than a sliding scale? Your Honor, it, it seems in the abstract perfectly logical to suggest that a bright line would be uh, desirable, but this court has foreclosed that kind of inquiry. Uh, well, I'm, I'm far, far from clear that, to me that that's true. Verdugo or Urquidez uh, remains the law of the land. Uh, certainly, Your Honor, Verdugo remains the law of the land, but there are elements of that opinion that have been clarified by the Boumediene opinion, as we, as we pointed out in our brief. Does it the suspension is, clause include the words, the people? Uh, no, Your Honor, the suspension clause does not. But the uh, Boumediene... So the analysis of Verdugo remains. I mean, you may be asking us to overturn Verdugo, but it remains intact. Your Honor, I don't think we have to overturn the parts of Verdugo that are that court's necessary holding. I do think this court needs to recognize dicta in Verdugo, and that's the, to the uh, extent that the reliance on the language of the people and the ratification history in the majority's opinion there, those, those reasonings have no bearing on the ultimate holding of that case, that the warrant requirement is impracticable and can't be extended extraterritorially for the home, for the home uh, of, of a foreign national. Now, that's because Justice Kennedy's crucial fifth vote joining the majority relied on a subset of the reasoning of the majority. And he said as much uh, in the opinion that he placed no weight on this notion of the ratification history or on this uh, text of the people. And he said he placed great weight on the notion that extending the Constitution abroad uh, is permissible unless doing so would be impracticable or anomalous. Now, he didn't pull that test out of thin air, Your Honors. That language comes directly from Justice Harlan's concurrence more than a half century earlier in Read Against Covert. And Justice Harlan's concurrence there didn't make it up either. It drew that, that concept from an analysis of In re Ross and the Insular cases more than a half century prior to that. And Your Honors, Justice Harlan said that In re Ross and the Insular cases hold that the particular local setting, the practical necessities, and the alternatives available are relevant to a question of extraterritorial judgment. And so it's Justice Harlan's initial accumulation of factors that informed the court's later reasoning in the 21st century in Boumedien. And that's the factors that led to the, this tripartite test that uh, Mr. Morgan referred to. But that, that tripartite test, if we apply, if we, if we continue on with that here, it, the first two factors don't seem to support you at all. Your Honor, that, that's uh, of no moment in this case because those really? are non-exclusive factors and they're not uh, each dispositive. It's not a, a so we don't weigh them at all? Absolutely, they're, they're weighed. And, and, I think, if, and do you agree that they, are, they both seem to weigh against you? Uh, I do not think all of the factors weigh against us, no. What about the first two? The, uh, let me see. Let me, let me so I, I think you're referring, Your Honor. The first one was the, uh, just the uh, citizenship, the lack of citizenship. Uh, the second was the, the nature of the location, nature of the location yeah. right. So, Your Honor, I think certainly citizenship and status of the claimant, we think that weighs against us. But that's of no moment because that, that didn't matter for the Boumediene court either, where not only were the claimants that's not true. U.S. citizens, they were in fact alleged to be enemy combatants detained mm -hmm. abroad. Now, the second factor, Your Honor, if applied directly as the way it was in Boumediene, would certainly weigh against us. We do not allege that there is de facto sovereignty over the area near the border. Mm -hmm. But we don't think that's necessary in the Fourth Amendment context. We think that the factors can be given different weight and different levels of, of analysis in different constitutional contexts. And so what might be relevant for the habeas context, namely absolute sovereignty and the history of dominion in the common law, as Justice Scalia pointed out in his dissent in that case, and as Justice Kennedy addressed in the majority opinion, do, uh, dominion and sovereignty have long played a crucial role in the habeas corpus context. But in the Fourth Amendment context, Your Honor, and in, in the nature of, of trial rights in particular, uh, those considerations melt away. And this is, becomes clear when we compare the past cases of Eisentrager and Reed against Covert. 
So in Eisentrager, this court said that habeas corpus rights did not extend to enemy combatants detained abroad at Landsberg Prison in Germany for a whole number of factors, including uh, the, the fact that allies would depend on how we treated these particular uh, war criminals, the fact that we'd have to use World War II era transport to bring the body over to a court of competent jurisdiction. But in Reed against Covert, just seven years later, that was of no moment when determining the trial rights of, of those abroad in England and Japan, the, the wives of American servicemen. And so the practical considerations between those two uh, locations would be different depending on the nature of the right invoked. And so the same is true here, Your Honors, that uh, the Fourth Amendment right does not implicate the same kinds of absolute control that habeas corpus does. But that also doesn't mean that that's the only way in which location could be relevant. Because as Your Honors pointed out in the petitioner's argument, the facts in this case do allege some amount of control over that area. And we don't think of it in terms of control. We think of it in terms of surveillance, of routine, regularly being patrolled. We think about it in terms of being subject to seizure from the United States side of the border. And this court need look no further than uh, page 54 of the appendix for the picture of Calle Internacional along the edge of the border wall. And we see that they run perfectly parallel with about 50 feet uh, separating vertically the top of the wall from the, uh, the road on which J.A. was shot. And so, Your Honors, we submit that the nature of the location is relevant here, and from that we derive one of our core limits, or limiting principles that we advocate today, and that is being subject to seizure from the U.S. side of the border and being in an area that is under the surveillance and regular patrol of the United States. And I think this goes to Mr. Morgan. you got a border town also in Verdugo. Absolutely. So what's the, what's the distinction you're attempting to draw between those two cases? Well, Your Honor, this goes back to the distinction between the rights being invoked. And now that is a Fourth Amendment case, but it's crucial to distinguish the warrant requirement is what the court was really addressing there for a search abroad. And, you know, six members of this court had no problem, even in the dissent, Justice Stevens had no problem suggesting that the warrant, the warrant requirement could not be practicable abroad. And, and while petitioners and suggest- was all the conduct, the government's conduct in Mexico in that case? That's right. Uh, but we think that that's not, uh, that particular fact in the search context is doesn't of no help, moment. Doesn't that help you in this case? No, certainly we think so. But we do want to be careful to clarify that we don't think the warrant requirement needs to be extended abroad. That the warrant requirement is impracticable and anomalous to extend abroad. But we think that's perfectly severable from the search and seizure protections, uh, or the seizure protections in particular in this case. And, and there's nothing unusual about precedent that. for chopping up the Fourth Amendment that way? Uh, Terry B. Ohio, Your Honor. Um, you know, the idea that uh, this court recognized a stop and frisk is both a search and a seizure and that warrants aren't required there. And there's any number of search and seizure precedent for this court in which warrants are not required. And so that, that requirement is actually frequently severed from the rest of the Fourth Amendment. Then more just that the jurisdictional analysis would be, would vary. Your Honor, I think uh, the Insular cases would, would do us well here in the sense that, as Mr. Morgan pointed out, there are uh, separate rights. There were certain fundamental rights recognized to apply from the beginning where the U.S. exercised sovereign power abroad in territories even before they were incorporated. But that did not mean that all constitutional rights applied always and everywhere is the language in the Balzac case from 1922. And in fact, the court was willing to parse different rights because of the unique historical judicial systems of those nations uh, before becoming part of the United States or, or before not even joining the United States that the certain constitutional rights applied uh, from the beginning in those territories. Now, Your Honors, while Petitioner wants to rely on his extraterritoriality argument to suggest that the law here was not clearly established, I think as Your, your Honors recognized, that quickly falls apart when we look at what actually must be proved for the, uh, the clearly established inquiry for qualified immunity, because it's about whether the officer had noticed, whether it's fair to hold an officer liable in this situation, so that when they are facing split-second decisions and exigent circumstances, they're not second-guessing their conduct about mistakes of law. Here, there are none of those concerns present. And as, as Your Honor, Chief Justice Moritz pointed out in the petitioner's argument, we can't rely on any question of citizenship or contacts uh, because that was unquestionably unavailable to Swartz. And so in the context available to Swartz, the question we ask for clearly established law is whether it was clearly unreasonable for him to shoot a child in the back 10 times for no reason. And this court doesn't need to spend too long on that question. And Your Honors, it's because tennis- How does the extraterritorial part of it factor into it, though? Well, uh, Your Honor- we've, we've been debating that for the last you know, half hour or so. And so what, what makes this clearly established, that, that portion of the inquiry? Well, Your Honor, I think Petitioner must concede that if J.A. was a citizen 
court, if this court were to determine that he had sufficient contacts, mm -hmm. that he would have enjoyed a fourth amendment right. In fact, I'm pretty sure petitioner conceded that point. That. Yeah. And, and so that law is certainly clearly established. And what we're really looking at here then is, is just the fact of a child walking away from the officer from a distance of about 30 feet, not running, not in a vehicle, and we need to look no further than this case, this court's recent cases on the use of force qualified immunity. Um, Mullenix v. Luna, three years ago, this court suggested that the proper inquiry is not some abstract inquiry uh, of the use of force because that obviously has been clearly established for more than 30 years. And so oh, the Fifth Circuit went the other way. So how is it possible that we're going to hold a border agent uh, to a legal position that even the Fifth Circuit didn't figure out? Your Honor, I think this court is certainly entitled to suggest that the, the Fifth Circuit was mistaken. And that's our position, is that the Fifth Circuit was We're going to hold the border agent to a higher standard than the Fifth Circuit? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, w w w there's certainly a circuit split on this exact issue right now. And we think this court can resolve that issue by uh, setting down a clear line that when an, when an officer does not know the nationality or contacts of his victim, he must exercise reasonable care of, of any officer, and no reasonable officer in this position would have thought it necessary to protect his life or the life of someone else. And so as this court said in Mullenix, the proper inquiry is whether it was clearly unreasonable for the officer in that position to take the action he did. And Does citizenship even matter in that analysis? No. Uh, all that matters are the facts that Agent Swartz could have known. Um, and you know, even if there were- You can't shoot a kid in the back. That's our position, Your Honor. Um, and, and that comes pretty clearly from Tennessee v. Garner, and I just want to briefly address this notion of the high level of the law because it's certainly true that Tennessee v. Garner might not be the controlling law in many cases. But that's because the role of precedent in this inquiry is to distinguish the hazy border between reasonable law enforcement conduct and unlawful, uh, you know, unreasonable searches. There's no hazy border in this case, and so the role of precedent diminishes. And this court's reiterated time and again in the Fourth Amendment context in Brosso against Hagen, uh, in Broso against Hagen, Mullenix v. Luna, Casella v. Hughes last term, that Tennessee v. Garner will provide uh, sufficient, clearly established law in the obvious case. That's the, the hope analogy, Your Honor. And so it has been connected to the Fourth Amendment context. Um, Your more difficult prong is the actual constitutional violation here, I think, isn't it? Uh, certainly, Your Honor. It seems like it's often the reverse of that for the, for the plaintiffs. Uh, certainly, Your Honor, we do think that's the more difficult prong, and, and we're not suggesting that that law was entirely settled, but we do think by this point, Boumediene has clarified the correct test and has made clear that uh, this century of precedent has identified this common thread of impracticability and anomalous uh, results being the, the ultimate test. And so we looked at the ultimate limits of uh, action from the United States. Uh, to be clear, you're asking for an extension of Boumediene, right? I mean, that involved a U.S. lease of over 100, 100 years. We don't have anything close to that here. It's an extension insofar as we're recognizing the nature of the location is relevant in ways beyond de facto control. So if, if we're thinking about Boumediene as purely about de facto control, then it would be an extension. But we don't think that's ever really been the, the inquiry based on uh, the Insular cases and, and Read Against Cover, where we didn't suggest we had absolute control over England or Japan, and we're willing to extend rights to those places or to the Philippines and Puerto Rico. And so we don't think that presents a, a particular problem here. Now, Your Honors, this court's jurisprudence for over 100 years has identified this common thread of impracticability and anomalousness and practical considerations. And here, as my colleague Mr. Hamilton pointed out, there are no real practical limits or, or practical obstacles to extending or to recognizing the right here. And there can be no more obvious case of an unreasonable use of force than shooting an unarmed child in the back 10 times. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd just like to address two issues. First, the national security issue under Bivens, and then I'll talk about the control theory under Boumediene. If there's time, I'll also address what exactly needs to be clearly established in that analysis. Mm -hmm. First, national security. Mr. Hamilton pointed out correctly that national security shouldn't be used as a talisman. But as this court explained in Abbasi, the main reason we have that concern is for domestic issues, for when there are violations domestically. And as Justice Ho correctly pointed out, it is a stretch to say that every domestic crime involves national security. Moreover, it's important to clarify what exactly this court needs to find under special factors analysis. As this court has explained, in every case for the last 39 years, all that is required is hesitation, not certainty. 
This court does not need to be certain that there is a national security concern. All that is required is that Congress might find that there is a national security concern. And in the words of Abbasi, if the court finds that, then the court must refrain. Second, under Boumediene, this court did establish a control theory. And today, Mr. Smith brings up a novel theory, which is that the Fourth Amendment requires a lower level of control in order to extend it extraterritorially. However, that is simply ignoring the main concern of verdugo Urquidez. As the court in verdugo Urquidez explained, that extending the right in that case would allow for a global class of individuals who could bring Fourth Amendment claims. And even though it is true that the United States exerts some control, it's not justified why that exertion of control would establish a Fourth Amendment right here, especially because, as Justice Restrepo pointed out, the United States theoretically has enough control to search the computers in Germany. And because every search and seizure to some degree requires some control, it seems like a strange line to say that you'd need a lower level of control for the Fourth Amendment when every Fourth Amendment re violation requires some level of control in the first place. Finally, on the clearly established front, it's important to note what exactly needs to be clearly established. And as this court has repeatedly told the Ninth Circuit in particular, what needs to be clearly established is that the right at issue is established with particularity. And as this court has instructed, if there is even some doubt then this court needs to find that that right is not clearly established. And al kid this court said the right needs to be settled beyond debate. Here, we might have facts that are similar to Tennessee v. Garner, but they are different in one crucial capacity, the border. And that is not a meaningless line in the sand in Arizona. That is a distinct legal definition. Because of this different category, it at the very least raises doubt. The issue is no longer settled beyond debate. And as the what you're saying is Fifth Circuit judges are reasonable. I am saying Fifth Circuit judges are reasonable. I just wanted to have your argument. Yes. yes. <laughs> if Fifth Circuit judges had some debate about it, then at the end of the day, it is reasonable that Agent Schwartz, in the words of Abbasi, could not have known and would not have predicted that he was violating the Fourth Amendment in what he did. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And we are going to take this matter under advisement very briefly. Uh, and the court will be in recess until we do. All right.
I'll get one to watch for the, the French game. Yeah, perfect. Let me just see how that's going to work. It's usually good here during the day. So okay. Start to see if that's okay, so let me just click one. Yeah, I'll go with it. Yeah, I think it says it all. Yeah. So for now, could you all just get together and make a nice foursome, and this will be a nice background. Stay together by teams, I don't want to break it up. <laughs> take, take a bit of a step toward me so you're not too up against the wall. There we go. Fantastic. Can you go ahead and smile? If you good, I'm going to do three clicks here. One, two, and three. And then let's keep our groups together. So let's see if you two gentlemen can go that way. Come on over. Come up a little further here. Just like that. Switch your heads up just a little bit. Hopefully, we'll let them do those two clicks. One, I, speaking of thank yous, I want to say a thank you to Brian Zako. He's your moot court president. Where's Brian? There. Thank you. This whole whole uh, event was so well put together and well staged and uh, professional. So thank you. And to your Dean's Cup coordinators. Can they all stand up? Jack Lucy, Logan Page. Yep, there they are. James Murray and Tyler Zellinger. Nice job. Thank you, guys. Thank you, too. And I don't know who all you are, but I want to thank all the participants uh, that participated in this particular competition. We were told there were quite a number of you and that this has been quite a long process and that there were some excellent competitors. And it's hard to fathom that considering how excellent the four of you were here today. But it, I just can't, I can't think of anything uh, that you could do for yourself and your careers that would be uh, more helpful than this this process that you've gone through. So to all of you who didn't make it to these seats, uh, great job and and uh, be proud of yourself and your involvement. Um, I also want to thank, uh, on behalf of the three judges, uh, the dean. She she has been so welcoming and so hospitable. We all want to just come back here and live and <laughs> spend our days here at Duke Law School. This is great. Yeah. Um, and Sarah Emily, where's Sarah? Sarah, thank you. Everything you've done to coordinate this has made it so easy for us, and it's just been a tremendous experience being here at Duke. Um, so thank everybody who's been involved. If I've missed anybody, I apologize. Uh, and we have made our decision, so we're going to go ahead and tell you that before and kind of stop the suspense, if that's all right with all of you. And then we just have a few comments. Um, is that all right with you guys? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the best team, very difficult decision, but we have chosen the petitioners. <laughs> and the best oralist is Mr. Jack Smith. All four stand up. That was just tremendous. I tell you what. And I, I uh, normally try to, you know, give some 
balanced comments. I, I don't have, <laughs> I, don't, I can't think of anything to offer the four of you. I want you to appear in front of me at the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals as soon as possible. <laughs> All four of you. That was just tremendous. You're obviously, you each had a, a complete command of the case law. Your advocacy skills are some of the best I've seen. I'm, I'm speaking about all four of you. So it, it was incredibly well balanced. I love the problem, by the way, because it, the problem uh, allowed for that balance. Um, but honestly, I thought you were all professional, all courteous in the way that you responded to our questions uh, and appropriate in every respect. I'm sorry I'm not giving you anything here, but uh, honestly, I just don't, oh, I don't often get to see this caliber, even though we see some very well well-qualified and capable practitioners in our circuits. I, I thought you folks did a wonderful job, and what I was, among the things that most impressed me is how well you responded to the questions. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that you have, really be proud of yourselves. And you listened to the questions and you answered them. You didn't shy away from the, from the difficult questions, and you did it in a very polite, uh, deferential manner, which is important. Whoever wrote the problem deserves a big shout out. Is the author of this problem here? Have I, have, have I met the author of this problem? <laughs> oh, there he is. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor. I've done a lot of these, not a lot, but several, and, and this is by far the, the best problem. It, it really presented great issues on both sides of the, of the V, so you, you thank you very much. And Dean, thanks again for, for inviting me, Sarah. But you, you folks were great. I mean, I couldn't agree more with Madam Chief Justice here. You're all more than welcome in the Third Circuit. And <laughs> anywhere else you might find yourselves. Good luck to you. I just want to echo what's been said. In my relatively short judicial tenure, I've had four moot courts so far. And this was, I think, by far the most. You then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, but I mean, honestly, this was the hardest call of mm -hmm. uh, the moot courts uh, yes, that I've done. I mean, you, you all were just exceptional and, and very, like, the differences were extraordinarily infinitesimally small. So congratulations to you all. Um, uh, you know, this was an interesting moot because it was actually fairly realistic. Mm -hmm. There were moments we were very, very hot. And there are moments where we let you talk. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a skill set that you mm -hmm. need as a fellow advocate because mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't know what panel you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be able to be agile, each of you uh, were, were, were very strong in that regard. And um, uh, I thought uh, you, you had a, a, a wonderful rebuttal, by the way. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just, uh, you, you, you took the podium, you, you had a very strong points you wanted to make, and it was a, a powerful re rebuttal time. Uh, I like the turns of phrases that you that you integrated. The, the, <laughs> the uh, constitutional rights aren't contagious. Not contagious, yes. <laughs> that got me in the brief, too. Humor, I like humor is actually kind of tricky mm -hmm. in, a, in an argument, mm -hmm. uh, but you did in a way that was appropriate. You weren't trying for a laugh. You were just mm -hmm. making a point that happened to generate some attention, uh, but you handled it in a, in a very, uh, uh, in a way that really uh, uh, expressed your point vividly and, and quickly. The, the tanks, I think it was just a tanks in Gitmo or something like that was also another good example. Mm -hmm. But both of you, I thought, did a great job integrating uh, discussions from the other side. You know, one of the most mm -hmm. important things about oral argument is actually not arguing, but listening. Mm -hmm. Listening to the other side, taking advantage of opportunities. Mm -hmm. The both of you very nicely borrowed from topside time to, to try to score points. Um, and uh, there's some pasta in our room. That should help. Um, I think that's it. I just also wanted to commend you on your briefs. The briefs were really outstanding. Mm -hmm. And in, in our circuit, most cases are decided on the briefs. We don't argue as many cases as some of us think we should. But so the briefs are really important for in, in appellate work, and the briefs in this case were really first rate. Well so done. Mm -hmm. I'll just echo the same comments. We're very, very much looking forward to watching you all appear before the objectable, objectively reasonable Fifth Circuit. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Congratulations. Thank you all. Thank you.